So um, I'm, I'm going pretty far back, um, starting in uh, 1995, 1996. Um, I was actually originally a painter. Um, and several years after getting out of art school, I started experimenting with um, all kinds of materials on the canvas and then eventually off the canvas onto the floor. Um, and I tried out a lot of different organic things like dirt and mold and um, marshmallows at one point. <laughs> um, and after a lot of uh, playing around, I kind of settled on um, uh, ma material of beeswax. Um, I wanted to use materials that were going to be very hands-on, um, which would allow me to do direct sculpting onto an armature or form. No fabrication, no toxic materials. Um, and so beeswax worked really well for that. And I um, would use it over an armature of paper mache and other materials underneath. Um, and I was interested in, um, in taking objects from the real world and then kind of magnifying them um, into this um, monumental scale. And the objects tended to be um, detritus, like, like um, breadcrumbs and um, discarded chicken bones, um, orange peels. And so it was like kind of playing with this idea of like monumentalizing garbage or detritus. Um, and also um, creating like a kind of um, heightened sense of perception as far as like the details where um, as if you were looking at the world through some kind of distortion lens. Um, so, so I'll show you just a few of these um, early pieces. There's a lot I'm leaving out during this time frame. Um, this is kind of jumping um, now to 2006. So I worked. I would work in a series. I would. I focused on bread for a while. So the previous slide was actually um, enlarged slices of bread and crumbs. Um, and, and this series started to get a little more abstract. Um, they were loosely based on cactus, cactus forms um, that I had seen in Joshua Tree. And they kind of, kind of created a kind of um, environment of, uh, that looked like almost like um, apocalyptic colors, you know, like <laughs> uh, very acidy colors. Um, and I was, I was interested in, um, in examining a kind of, um, I don't know, kind of going into subconscious, um, uh, uh, mind frame. Um, there's a lot of like decay, reference to decay and regeneration, regeneration and rebirth, um, the absurd, you know, like the, the grotesque, um, all those kinds of things and, and everything kind of loosely related to the body as well. Um, and this piece here is from 2007, it's called Portal. Um, it's about six or seven feet tall. So it was probably the, one of the larger pieces that I had made. Um, with the beeswax. And it ended up being the last one that I made with beeswax. Um, so in, also in this, in this period, I began to be interested in the idea of um, the sculpture that looks back at the viewer. Um, and it was kind of, it was kind of like a way of thinking of like of the scu of a sculpture. Um, is having a kind of presence that, that transmits um, a, a, an energy into the environment around, uh, around it. And the viewer is the kind of, is the receiver of this energy. And 
I was interested in the exchange between the two, um, the, the exchange between um, the viewer and the artwork, what, what happens between them. Um, so that the meaning and power of the work is kind of rooted in that exchange between the viewer and the object. Um, so around this time, I also had a kind of crisis with the material um, where I was feeling like um, a kind of tyranny from my use of <laughs> this one material over and over again. I was very um, kind of dependent on it. And it's, it's a very slow labor intensive process working with the beeswax um, I have to melt it in a double boiler. And, um, and it would take an extraordinarily long time to make um, these pieces. And I was starting to feel like ideas were coming faster than I could execute them. Um, so I needed to uh, figure out a way to break away from the beeswax. Um, and I ended up uh, over like a period of many months um, trying to make forms without putting beeswax on them. It was very hard <laughs> because nothing ever looked complete unless I covered it with the wax. And then finally, one day I had um, a piece that was like very um, kind of um, pared down to the armature materials that I had always used beneath the, the wax. So like under this form, there's paper mache over metal, over wood, um, and wire and all kinds of stuff. So here you can see the, the details were very um, intensely kind of focused on. And so I used these, these armature materials um, in a piece and let the piece sit in the studio for a period of time, like it was over several weeks and where I was not allowed to touch it. No, no beeswax allowed. <laughs> and then finally one day after several weeks of this, I looked at the piece and, and decided that it was finished. Like it just kind of hit me. Like it was a sort of um, a eureka moment where I, I realized, oh, wow, that piece is actually done. It, it, I, I was able to accept it. And, and from that point on, it kind of opened up the doors for all kinds of things to happen, unexpected um, uh, things, new materials, anything could suddenly become pulled into the sculpture and be used as a material. So I started to, um, I, it kind of like transformed the whole way that I worked. Um, I became much more improvisational in my approach. So with the beeswax, I had a very kind of methodical approach of like A plus B equals C. I, I kind of knew what the piece would look like by the time it was done, more or less. But with this way of working, it was very exciting because I really didn't know where um, where the piece would end up. I would start with a piece of metal and I would kind of bend it into a shape. Um, and I would make all kinds of little fragments of things and bring them together. Um, and so there was a lot of like um, putting in, taking away. Um, and it felt mu much more like play, like playing. Um, it, was, it was very, um, spontaneous and improvisational. And um, it, it was like the equation went from the A plus B plus C to being a much more kind of complex, um, you know, br bringing in like way more numbers into the equation. Um, so, so then the work started to change as a result of these new, um, this new approach and these new materials. And um, I, 
I began to think of them more as this kind of um, diagrammatic constructions that were um, dealing with both microspace and, mi and macrospace at the same time, where they could be like something you would see under a microscope or they could be something you would see in a galaxy. Like they had this, like I was, I was kind of, I was kind of wanting them to have this kind of um, expansion in the way that they dealt with um, the kind of space that you think of in your head. When you look at the work, you could think of them in this more kind of expansive way, not just the object that you see in front of you, but what that object is signifying spatially. If that makes any sense, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, so there's, you know, so the cosmos solar system is being referenced here. Um, and I would bring in all kinds of like objects that were like test pieces that had been sitting around in my studio for years, or even like fragments of discarded sculptures, I would, I would recycle them into these new pieces. Um, so some of the, some of this work contains like this piece here. Do you guys see my arrow? Can I use this arrow to point? Yeah. So like in this piece, there's um, this section here is actually made of cat litter, which I realized is actually clay. <laughs> I never knew that. Um, and then these little elements here were like little fragments that I had had been sitting around in my studio for years. So it was really, really like a like a new fun way of working. And um, and I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, to be honest. Like I didn't know, like I didn't have like some grand concept for what I was doing, but I felt like the materials and the work were leading the way. They were just leading me someplace. Um, and I was following it, following whatever, wherever they were, was taking me. Um, so this piece here has like a cactus that I recycled here at the bottom, one of the beeswax things. Um, so this now, this is from, let me get the year. Um, so two, 2012, this show was titled Lost Songs of the Filament. Um, I was playing a lot of music at the time. I started playing, um, collaborating with this friend of mine who's also a sculptor, Jennifer Syrie. Um, and we started collaborating, collaborating on music uh, projects together. Um, and I was playing with other playing music with other people, like in a more kind of improvisational way. And a lot of the wordplay that was happening with the songs that we were writing started to seep into and influence my, my sculptures. So, the, so I got really into like coming up with titles for sculptures then, like, a, like it was sort of related to the, the uh, songwriting and, and also the improvisational um, way of working was being kind of driven partially by some of the musical things that I was doing. Um, so I'll uh, show you some pieces. This one is called, Let Me Love Your Brain. So in this piece, the um, giant chicken bone, which is about six feet tall, is a recycled work that was originally made in 1997. Um, and so I kind of gave it a new life <laughs> um, in, this, in this piece. Um, and I was really like having fun, like getting things to balance, just like using gravity as a material, you know, like just like getting something to stand without toppling over was kind of um, part of the uh, excitement uh, around how these things were constructed. Um, and I was trying to find a way of making a work where, um, oh wait, I didn't tell you, the name of this piece is um, Cloud, Cloud, Mind, Cloud Minder, which is from a Star Trek episode, <laughs> old Star Trek. Um, I was kind of looking for a way of making work. 
Can you guys still hear me? Because my speaker just went off. You hear me? Okay, good. I was kind of looking for a way of making work the work feel like um, like it has this kind of um, uh, risk built into it where it's not fully balanced, like like where you could look at it and feel like it could possibly just fault the whole thing could just collapse, you know, like I wanted it to have, I wanted to have, I wanted, I wanted to capture a kind of tension with the gravity, with the play against gravity. Um, so I was trying to, um, to play with balance in a way that where it wasn't, where things were not too balanced, <laughs> if that, if you know what I mean, like not like, like, um, just to, to kind of push at the um, boundaries of what makes something acceptable as a work of art. So this is a little detail from the back of this work, which I, I should tell you the title is um, Transmissions of the Threadbare is the name of this one. And this one is called God's Eye, spelled with a, a Z. Um, and it kind of came about where I was like working with um, uh, the uh, plastic lace, which is this material that you see in the center, the colorful uh, plastic lace that people use for bracelets and things. And I was kind of working it through this armature and I realized that it looked just like a giant God's Eye. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of went with it and kept going and made this this um, this large piece that I think in the end feels very much like um, like a transistor of some kind. So it like a a giant transistor. So it kind of um, you know going back to this idea that I was talking about earlier of the of the sculpture that looks back at you, you know, that is like transmitting into space. This one is called um, Once Upon a Time, The End. And another um, big influence around this time was um, I had had a kid. And so he was, he would come to the studio with me and um, I would like set him up in a corner with just some you know, stuff to play around with. And I would be like sitting in a chair, staring into space, trying to decide, trying to figure out what to do, you know, like for hours. And I'd look over at my kid and he would be like making like one thing after another, just like cranking all this stuff out. And I was so taken with his ability to do that. And it really like seeped into um, a lot of the uh, things that were happening around this time with my work. Um, like, like, for example, like this piece, you know, wouldn't stand, you know, so instead of like, like really like thoughtfully engineering a um, solution to the problem of how to make this thing stand, I grabbed a large rock that I had in my studio and just plopped it down on the bottom of the piece and and I thought, well, this will just be temporary um, until I figure out something else. And then of course that ends up being the thing that's the best. <laughs> so it was like a way of working where the spontaneity was something that I was like welcoming in the work, you know, as, as solutions on un, un, um, unexpected solutions to problems. This one is called Oracle in Reverse. It's a little nod to um, Robert Smithson title. And a similar thing happened here where like this central form, um, I had to uh, balance it on this blob. Um, it was falling over uh, either way. So I hung the screws from here and then those ended up being part of the piece, even though they were originally a temporary solution. Um, this one is called The Collector. Um, and it was um, kind of, you know, envisioning this 
um, form that is just absorbing everything in its path. Um, there's actually two pitchforks. There's one in the back that you can't see. And I forgot if I included photos of, no, I didn't. I want to sometimes show photos of like the process of making the, the piece. Um, Cause it's not always that clear when a piece is done. <laughs> I kind of think, I kind of feel like when I'm working sometimes um, I, I let things sit for long periods of time. Um, I don't um, like I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let things sit in the studio for months and work on different things at the same time. And then when they get to a point where they're not annoying me anymore, <laughs> then they, that's usually a sign that they, that they're done. Um, so, but then this thing always happens where I look back later and I'm thinking like, well, actually I could keep going on that. <laughs> I could recycle this work and turn it into something else or expand it into an installation. So I've, I continue to feel like there's an open-endedness to the work where um, it, there really is never an ending in a sense, you know? Um, so that's, that's like a, that's something that, um, I have to think about more these days, actually. This piece here is, uh, is called Script Analysis of the Enigma, and it's, uh, quite tall. It's like 15 feet. Um, and I thought of this as like a giant transistor, um, it's also uh, referencing the um, Enigma machine that Alan Turing invented. Um, where am I here? So one of the things that um, that I was playing that I was really uh, playing with with this new um, approach was the power of line. So, so all the strings and the wires and the yarns um, became incorporated as as a language that deals with space. You know, so you you can think of like the line as like the drawing in space, um, but. The other th thing that that I was drawn to was um, was the, the 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 ability of line to um, suggest an expanse an expanse that can go on into infinity. So when you have a line fragment, right, it has like a beginning and end. Um, it's it's still like every line will suggest. Um, the continuation of that line. So, so I like the way that um, that a line, like for example, like if you if you had a line, if you had a string hanging from the ceiling to the floor, then you're you know you have this relationship that you set up between the ceiling and the floor that is immediate. Immediately, those two things become connected, and beyond that, the line suggests a continuation into space, into the sky, um, or down into the earth. And so I realized that there was this kind of power that I could achieve through minimal means in a way, you know, like I could like expand into the space using just the, the skinniest, most delicate thing as a thread. Um, and so that becomes something that I have been playing with more and more seriously. And also um, it is a hugely um, less weighty, massive space occupying object. A piece of string folds up, squishes into nothing. And, and the difference between like, for example, like this big uh, form over here, the giant mushroom, is huge, you know, like, and if any of you 
on this Zoom call happen to be sculptors. Um, you know that after a little bit of time goes by, you suddenly have a studio filled with objects that are taking up space. And so I became more and more drawn to these um, materials that are more collapsible. Um, so this piece here is called, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's called self, -re self reflexive narcissistic supernova. That's the whole title. <laughs> um, and it in the form on the right here is actually a giant beeswax mushroom. So it's recycled from uh, a piece that was made in 2000, the year 2000. Um, it's about five feet in diameter. And so I had that, I, it originally it was a nine foot tall mushroom. Um, I took the stem off of the mushroom. And so this is just the cap without the stem. So I had that in my studio and then I had this kind of large amoeba form that I was working on um, with all this kind of these little things stuck in it. And, and I, I decided to um, marry the two forms together and connect them with pieces of string. And then this is the view from the other side of the mushroom. Um, and then I would, I, I would stretch the yarns and strings from one point on the back of the mushroom cap to various points all along this amoeba shape. And from those strings, I hung mushrooms, real mushrooms, that is, that would dry on the string. So they were um, fully pungent mushrooms when I first hung them. And then over the course of several weeks, they dried out and became lighter and lighter. Um, so this piece is quite large. It's like takes up like, I don't know, like 15 feet across the floor. Um, and where the stem of the mushroom used to be, it's just a hole where the, the, for the pipe to, to uh, attach. And this is a side view. And so the, the mushroom is kind of um, projecting an image of itself into space. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of the idea there. Um, and, you know, just um, at the same time that this piece was, was being made, um, I just happened to be watching all of the early Star Trek episodes in succession, one after another. I know this is the second time I've mentioned <laughs> Star Trek, um, but there was this one episode called The Immunity Syndrome, and it was about... Um, a, a giant amoeba that was living in space they, that the enterprise comes across in space it was 11 miles across um, this amoeba and it would it, it would just suck everything in and eat everything in its path um, and it had to be destroyed of course um, so I thought there was the absurdity of that was so Right, you know, like I just love like that I, the idea of this eleven mile amoeba. Um, so th that was kind of a little bit of inspiration that went along with behind uh, this this work here. So this one is called um, "Powers of Tenuous," which is um, a reference to "Powers of Ten," a movie, uh, a film short film by Ray and Charles Eames that is about scale, which if you've never seen it, it's a small masterpiece. <laughs> um, and here is now, what year is this? 2016, I just wanna make sure I'm giving you the right information. Um, yeah, so this is, 2014 actually these last two pieces um so this this work here i started to play around with bread uh real bread um i had um you know we were buying bread at home all the time and it would dry out in like one day and 
I would, I was so frustrated with the amount of bread that we were throwing away. I decided to bring some to my studio and see <laughs> if maybe it could be put to use. So I discovered that the bread was actually, when it dried, it doesn't get moldy if you dry it out. Um, and it becomes very, very strong, almost like some like um, fossilized uh, uh, piece of, you know, something or other. So I started to play around with it um, as material. I would seal the bread with this um, vinyl uh, paint and it held up really well. And then I began to notice um, through doing a little research that there's bread out there in the world um, that's quite old. Like in the British Museum, there's a loaf of bread that's over 3000 years old. Um, in the Metropolitan, there's bread from Egyptian uh, tombs that's equally old. Um, and then recently, most recently, um, breadcrumbs were found <laughs> in Jordan um, that are 14,000 years old. So we now know that bread was actually predating agricultural times. Um, bread was being made by the hunter gatherers, the foragers um, that predate, um, predates uh, settle, settled um, communities with agriculture. So that, that's really wild. Um, and I, so I started seeing, I see the bread as a kind of like, um, has like a, a lot of history, social history behind it. And so there was something interesting about using it as a material and also like um, my interest in fungus and mushrooms and decay and um, yeast, which is used to make bread is a fungus. So the fungus has a DNA, it's, um, it's uh, and so it's so all of those kind of things kind of inspired you know, my thinking about, um, about what the forms mean. Um, so I don't really set out to make meaning, you know, it just kind of, it kind of evolves through the making of the piece. Um, but that's one of the, one of the things that started to um, come out through this work. Um, so this one is called Porous Porous. Um, so, so it's kind of playing with the idea of like the pores of the bread and the pores of the uh, foam down here, um, all kind of, you know, like kind of um, holes within holes within holes, kind of uh, riffing off each other formally. So here's some details. Um, and uh, yeah, so the bread, you know, Occasionally a crumb will fall off <laughs> and I sometimes replace them, sometimes not. Um, so I consider it to be um, a work that is using an ephemeral material, but also is kind of about the ephemerality. So it's, um, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to disguise uh, the fact that it will eventually um, go to dust. But I also feel strongly that um, there's no problem with that. Um, you know, the work will survive me probably. Um, and I just, I kind of almost feel like these days, like the idea of like making a work of art that has to be permanent on the planet is almost laughable. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why I, I cho choose this material and, you know, do it, you know, uh, without worrying too much. So this is uh, a whole group of bread pieces, tabletop pieces. Um, kind of playing with the idea of like mini transistors as opposed to the giant trans transmitter. These are like radio, little radios, you know, tabletop radios. 
and just show you some little details of the, um, the bases tend to be just like found objects. Um, these are, are, and I call these drift loaf. Um, all these bread pieces are, are drift loaf and drift loaf totems. These are meaning, you know, the, the, the shape being kind of totemic. Um, so these are actually full loaves that are glued together, sawed and, and then glued together. And this one is called uh, Foot of a Grimy, made of a lot of sticks and was very tricky getting this to stand. So dealing with the balance thing here was kind of fun. Um, Colony Collapse is the name of this one. So now we're at um, 2017-2018, that's when the, this show was from, um, and the title of the show was Dawn of the Looney Tune, which is the title of the central piece here, the orange one. Um, so they were, I started these works around 2016. Um, there was a certain kind of, um, uh, well, so I, so I, I, I think of myself as the kind of artist who works as a, it's almost like a filter. Like I, I take in the news and information and things I read, things I hear, and blah blah blah. And then I kind of like I absorb and I filter everything and and regurgitate this work out the you know through this filtration process. So at the time there was a lot. Of, you know, there was the election. There was all this like kind of like. In, insane shit going on. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I was kind of playing off, I mean, I'm not playing off, but I, I was tapping into this feeling of like kind of unhingedness um, and circus craziness that I was feeling um, with these works. And um, this one here is called That's All Folks like the Looney Tunes, the end of the Looney Tunes cartoon. Um, this uh, object in the middle is actually a hubcap that's covered with um, aqua resin. And this here is a piece of mylar that's reflecting. So the hubcap is like looking at itself. And it, the uh, mylar kind of turns around slowly. So creates reflections. Um, this one is called Void Sorption. And it has more of the dried mushrooms in there. Um, so this piece is Dawn of the Looney Tune. So uh, I was kind of wanting to make something orange, you know, like just like as this like kind of um, I don't know, the, the color orange seemed to have like this new significance <laughs> at the time. So I, um, I hung carrots in this work uh, from the market. And then during the course of the show, um, I would come in every like five days or so um, to do what I call the feeding of the carrots. Um, so I would bring in new carrots, fresh, fresh carrots and hang them from the piece. And then over like the course of um, five days or so, they would start to dry and shrink and get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so the piece contains all the little shrunken carrots as well as like the fresher ones. So anytime, fresh carrots were hung in the work, it would activate the color orange. And so it would become, um, you know, kind of like 
wake the piece up in a sense through feeding, feeding it carrots. <laughs> this one is called clown clutter. And there's a lot of like um, household sponges in this work here. Um, in this, with the same group, um, I included some pieces that are of a more experimental nature. Um, in these works, I, I allowed the bread to become moldy and I contained them in these um, aquarium tanks with some other different kinds of debris and stuff. Um, and then I'd seal the top. Um, and then over a period of time, like the, the mold would grow and it would kind of bloom. And then it would, sometimes it would start to, to, it would die and it would kind of shrink down a little bit or the colors would change. We'd get all kinds of interesting colors in there. Um, and I had names for them, like uh, I call them the pet series. So this is called Degenerate Pet. Um, this one is called New Pet. This one got really big blooms on it. Um, they're really disgusting. <laughs> Much worse in real life. Um, this one is called Pet of a New Order. So the only unfortunate thing about the, this series is that despite uh, my sealing the tank, um, the, the mold inside, the fungus inside found a way to creep out. And so you could smell them. So the smell was, after a while, it was just like, ah, I can't, I can't, I had to throw away most of these pieces. This one is the only one that survived um, because it didn't have a smell, <laughs> but the other two, the smell was just like, <laughs> it just kept, and what's disturbing about that is that the fungus finds a way out. Like it actually goes through the glass and the, you know, the, the, um, the silicone that, that is sealing the glass, the glass tank the fungus is able to travel out of that. So that I thought was pretty crazy, remarkable, weird. Um, this piece here is called the bozo. And this is a dry mushroom. Um, this one is called substantial stringata. So this is 2018 and I'm just gonna skip here. Um, so this is another mushroom piece called um, motherboard. And one of the things that interests me in um, mushrooms is the mycelium, which now there's a, a lot of really great, really great books out right now about um, mycelium and how uh, it is basically like the internet underneath the ground that, um, that can facilitate communication between trees and other plants um, through their roots. Um, so the mycelium, my, the mycelium is like central to that activity. Um, so this, you know, this piece, kind of nodding to the idea of like the network and um, the communication, unseen communication. Um, and there's a few, there's this, this other book called um, The Hidden Life of Trees that also talks about that. If any of you have ever um, read that, I have, if you haven't read that, it's a great, it's a great book. Um, this is called um, Map of an Organ Donor. And uh, that is 2018 also. Okay, so this one here is from 2020 and it's called Just Why Do You Think You're a Plant? Which is um, a line from a Philip K. Dick, Philip K. Dick story called Piper in the Woods. 
And it's about this astronaut who comes back from a mission to um, the base planet, wherever that is. Um, and he's gone on a mission to Mars. And when he comes back, he's decided that he's a plant. And so he tells everyone that he's a plant and he gets sent to um, the psychiatrist's office. And then um, the psychiatrist asks him, just why do you think you're a plant? <laughs> so I was kind of interested in the idea of like, um, the kind of connect connection between all like living organism, plant, human, you know, uh, fungus, animals, um, and how um, all genetic material is like, it's like shared by everything, right? Um, what else was I gonna say, tell you about this piece? Oh yeah, so this weaving here in the center, um, I've usually, I've, I've done like very kind of free form weaving. It's, I call it fake weaving because I'm not a weaver, a trained weaver and I don't, I don't use a loom or you know, anything uh, that uh, traditional or crafty. Um, but I did start to uh, do like a more kind of methodical weaving with the over and under, over, under style. Um, and so I would, I would make a form using um, a solid core wire and then um, I would stretch the yarns across um, the wire. And so the form would always become, be like kind of a free form. And, and then I would weave um, the, the other uh, yarns up over and under. So it's like a very, very simple um, uh, technique. And these are just some close-ups of this piece that includes a lot of like dyed textiles and other objects. There's um, dried lotus root in here and anise over here. Um, other different little things. Um, this one is called Orbit of the Haggis. And it's, uh, it's about 10 feet tall, I think. Um, this is a recycled uh, beeswax ball that used to be a giant eyeball. <laughs> I turned it into just a blue ball um, back from the days I worked with the beeswax. And I kind of thought of this piece as this like kind of harbinger of doom in a way, like I, or like some something kind of dark, like the, a black hole. Um, and it also has like a very kind of um, figurative presence to it, um, like, a, like a, a body. These are um, these reishi mushrooms um, that are quite, quite big. Um, this one is called Star Zero. So more of this kind of more methodical weaving. Um, so this piece is a freestanding piece, um, but I figured out a way to make it look like the star point is standing straight up without hanging it from the ceiling. Um, there's like a little piece of metal back there that supports it kind of like this, this piece here. And some close-ups. Um, so I'm just gonna show you now the last few works. We're right at the end here. And these um, are in the show that's up in New York right now. Um, I showed, showed this in Portland a few months ago and now I'm showing them here. Um, this one is called Red Sun. So it's a, it's a wall piece. So these pieces that I'm showing you now, um, they were made over a course of a couple years. Um, part of that time was the lockdown and all that. And I left New York 
for about five months and lived in the country. And so the pieces are made both in New York and in Mass rural Massachusetts. Um, and I, I was like really taken in by um, the night sky during that period. And so there was, I was doing a lot of like lying in the field, looking at the stars, that kind of thing. And so the pieces kind of reference um, some of that experience, um, which, you know, was very, for me anyway, it was like, I've never spent that long <laughs> ever outside of New York, uh, outside of a city, you know? So it was like really intense for me. Um, and those are lotus roots. This is the largest of the, the group. Um, this is called I Talk to the Trees, which is, can you turn that up? Which is also um, title of a song that I wrote during that time. <laughs> and a close up of this one. Um, one of the things that I observed in the sky was I started to feel like it was like a giant eye looking down at the earth. So there is a kind of, um, you know, reference to an eye form in these pieces. This one is called Eight Body Chorus, which is also um, uh, Referencing a title of a series called Three Body Problem. Anybody read that book, that series? That's science fiction, it's really great. And there's just to give you some sense of scale there. So I'm back working with beeswax again. Those are those two balls are brand were brand were made for this piece, not recycled. <laughs> And some close-ups. That's the mushroom in there. And there's the whole group together. So we're just about at the end here. Um, I've show you this is the last piece that left my studio, um, which con contains another hubcap. And also this object here is a um, paper wasp nest that I found. And that's all I got. <laughs> I'm watching with Marguerite and I'm actually the one with the question, I'm Gwyneth. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about the um, organic materials you worked with before arriving at the beeswax. You said you were working with yeast and some orange peels. I also work with biomaterials in my practice, so I'm curious what kind of um, processes you uh, went through and maybe how that experience informed some of your work later, just like working oh, okay. Yeah, so I um, I experimented with growing mold, you know, like I would grow mold in a bucket and see what would happen and see what I could do with that. Then there was a piece I made out of um, dirt, out of soil, and I made a hole and I put marshmallows in there and then the mold grew out of the marshmallows. Um, so I was just kind of like playing around with with um, these organic things. And then um, I had another piece that used the cat litter and potatoes together, if you can imagine <laughs> those two things together. I don't know. Um, potatoes that would sprout, you know. And, and it was, it was um, it, I think it definitely informed, um, I mean, I was, I'm interested in those things. I'm totally like, that's like, I'm interested in stuff in biology and, and, and decay and fungus were, you know, they were in the picture as like a subject that I was interested in, like how 
um, decay is also then rebirth, you know, so the two go hand in hand. Um, so conceptually, it was like relating to stuff I was thinking about. Um, but then I got uh, into the beeswax part partially also because it was made by bees. So I really liked the idea of like using this material that another animal has made and it's gone through their body, you know. Um, I, and, and I, I tried, I, I remember there was one, there was a piece I made that was this giant wedge of cheese made out of beeswax and I tried burying, burying some mold in it <laughs> and it kind of failed, like it didn't work out, you know. So I just went down the beeswax path um, and then all that stuff started creeping back in in different ways later. Um, so it looks like you had some questions in the chat. In the, um, oh, in the chat. I think. Um, see. What is the large chicken bone made of? So the, the large chicken bone is made out of plaster over an armature form. So the armature is um, metal, like steel, rolled up steel and foam, uh, polyurethane foam that's wrapped around that. And then... Um, plaster that's um, sculpted on. So it's not cast, it's like sculpted with plaster. Um, so the drift loaves, someone wants to know how large the drift loaves are. They're um, tabletop sized. So the biggest one is like maybe 30 inches tall and the smallest, is, you know, with the pedestal. And the smallest one is like, just a few inches high, like where I put like a crumb on a on a pedestal. <laughs> How do you transport the ones that require a lot of balance work? So everything I make breaks down into parts. Um, now it's taken me like 25 years to figure out the most practical way to do that. Um, in the beginning, it was not terribly practical. Like I would try to make them break down and they sometimes would still, they would get too big and, you know, it was like a mess. Um, but now they break down like these, like this one here that you're, that you're looking at um, is stretched. It's, it's stretched on, there's a, a conduit um, that's the blue line there. So that conduit gets unscrewed and breaks down into smaller pieces. And then the big weaving thing, uh, textile thing, just gets unstretched and fold, folds up and can go into a box. Um, so it's, it's become much easier to move them. So yeah, if, do you have a more, another question about the transporting? Like the, some of the ones in the, in the earlier, some of the earlier ones, like the collector, the one with the uh, um, uh, pitchforks in it, you know, like that one, uh, the whole structure pulled out of the milk crates, but it was like really a pain to move it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in learning more about your music. What is your instrumentation? So I play guitar. And my collaboration is with my friend, Jen, that's called Billy Goat. And we've not recorded, we have no official recordings. <laughs> uh, we hope to one day, and we occasionally do perform though the last two years we've not because of uh, pandemic. So it's been a while, but we're gonna get back to it soon. It's really fun. Um, and I don't know if anyone here plays music, but I have found music to be like when I, I didn't, I didn't grow up playing music. Um, I kind of taught myself to play guitar, um, you know, like maybe, um, I think it was maybe 20 years ago, um, something like that. So I was full, full adult. <laughs> um, and I felt like when I, did that something changed like like my whole approach to making work happened at the same time that I started learning guitar it was around that same period 
Um, so I feel like, like there's like something like music, like maybe, maybe it's not just music, but like other activities can do things to your synapses sometimes that's to make you look at things differently. Um, it's very helpful. So I use both acrylic and wool. Um, those are the yarns that I use. I really like the colors that I get in acrylic yarn. Um, they're very, they can be like really bright, really, really flashy. Um, and I like the kind of modernity that they have, like there's a modernity to plastic that I'm kind of attracted to. So like I use like in this piece here, um, all these colors here that you see floating, that's actually acrylic polymer. It's just uh, acrylic paint um, used like a skins. Um, and, and then I use, and I also use wool. So like this piece has both wool and acrylic, the yellow, um, but the wool colors tend to be much warmer, much more kind of um, organic -y feeling than the acrylic. Um, I have had also a little bit of trouble with wool here and there with moths. <laughs> I had a disaster once with a piece. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not ever going to use exclusively wool in a piece again. Um, I'm always going to be mixing it up, I think, because of that experience. Yeah, I'm really interested in how you work with ephemeral materials and your interest in decay. And I'm wondering um, what your experience is when you work with people who want to collect your work or when your work is exhibited over a period of time or like where you store it, uh, where, you, where you store it, because um, since it's ephemeral, the humidity and temperature can greatly influence how the work smells or um, yeah, yeah. how it behaves. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the bread pieces have held up really well. Um, if, if a piece of bread is dropped on the floor, it might even survive that sometimes because it's become so light after it's dry. And I've had pieces some that have not done well when they fell, you know, and that I've had to glue back together. Um, but in all in all, like, I have found that there's a strange kind of, I mean, maybe it's not strange. It's actually, it's not strange at all, but there, I do feel that people are very afraid of organic material. Like it's untidy, it's dirty, it's gonna, it rep, and it obviously like, represents something psychologically to people that um, is one of the reasons why people are afraid. You know, it's, it's maybe connected to, but you know, the association with decay is, 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 uh, is related to death and people are afraid of death. Um, so, so, you know, definitely I've, I feel like just in the culture at large, there's this kind of fear of that in art, you know. But now more and more you see it becoming more acceptable and um, go, you know, to a museum these days and you'll find uh, people using organic materials. Um, I, there's, oh, there's this really great Salvador Dali piece at, at MoMA of um, this bust of a woman. Uh, it's like a mannequin bust and she has a baguette, a dried baguette on her head. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> so I love looking at like old work like that, that, that has held up over time. Um, you know, that piece was from, I think originally it was made in the thirties and then it was, it's, the label says remade 1970. <laughs> so something must've happened to that loaf of bread. <laughs> uh, Michelle, this is Marguerite. Yeah. I have a question about the organic stuff because I've worked a lot with seed pods and leaves um, in my sculptures. And I have also done cast 
uh, bronze seed pods and leaves. And what I find is people will buy the ones that are bronze, but they're not, nobody has bought the stuff that has the actual, the, the real thing on it, the organic, you know, seed pods and stuff. So it makes me a little shy, I still use it. But <laughs> I noticed that your, your work has moved away from so much organic stuff. And now you're doing all the strings and the, the nylon and the uh, bright colors and stuff. Is did that influence you? That um, you know, when you see when you notice people were shying away from your organic stuff. Um, not really. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't say that I felt any kind of pressure whatsoever from a market because I don't. Well, I mean, first of all, my work does not sell very often. So really? oh. <laughs> whether it's organic or not. <laughs> so I, so in a sense, like that's given me the freedom to do whatever I want. Um, right. and, and, and I, and I do anyway. And, and, and uh, quite a few people do own the bread pieces um, because, you know, they are small tabletop work. So Right. Um, they're easier to own um, than something like this, which is enormous. Um, so, so, so far I've not had people complaining about, um, yeah, I go ahead. Your, all your weaving stuff got more and more complex, which I love, and the colors and stuff. Did you take a class in like how to do all that weaving and whatnot? No, no, I out. didn't. I just knew like I could weave doing over and under, over and under. So it's, it was like, you know, it's like the most basic technique, nothing to it, no loom. <laughs> it must've taken you a long time. Does that stuff take you tons they, of time? It's pretty time, it is pretty time consuming. It's funny cause like I work with beeswax which is very time consuming and labor intensive. And then I started to like free, free up from that, you know, and work much faster. And now I'm starting to slow down again because of the weaving. <laughs> so it's like coming back full circle, but it's still like the weaving that I do, like I figured out, like it's, it's not exclusively weaving, you know? So there's a lot of other things going on um, that, um, that can uh, pull me out of like the labor intensive uh, parts. You know, like in this piece here, there's like the blue part here in the center um, is all woven. So that part took a very, very long time, you know, but then other parts were fast, you know, so there's like a good balance now. You use some iconography connected with indigenous cultures like the God's Eye and Donovan's and your most recent work on the elaborate dream catch. I mentioned to hear more about your interest in indigenous iconography practices and how they might be connected to your materials. So I didn't set about making a dream catcher. I know people often look at my work and they say, oh, that looks like a giant dream catcher. But I never, I never intentionally like decided to reference the dream catcher. It just kind of happened like, like when I made that God's eye thing, you know, the, the, the thing that ended up looking like a God's eye, it was, um, it, it was not my intention to make a God's eye. It, it kind of evolved through the uh, way, the process that I was using to uh, strand the uh, material on this armature and but then you know like i i went to a summer camp where i had to make god's eyes in in the arts and crafts class like we did that like it just was like a thing like we were all making them um so i feel like like the like culturally it's also like me going back to like the 70s, you know, like when I was a kid and this kind of imagery was like of the popular culture. If that answers question somewhat. 
remember what I was saying before about the power of the line, the, you know, the yarn, the thread, the wire. Um, so one of the things that I really want to ex take further is the scale of the works. I'm, I'm, um, I want to explore like, um, I want I want to I want to try to work with this kind of material on an even bigger scale um, as something that could be like as powerful as like let's say Richard Serra wall you know like <laughs> the massive wall you know like I I there's to I want to be able to do that with these kind of soft um, pliable materials that kind of to take it in that direction not not installation art but pieces you know like uh, one uh, more I, just came I, in I, i'm curious about your practice you mentioned you're mostly city-based but of course you're here and you're working every day i i try to go to my studio every day i usually end up going at least five days a week um between you know teaching um i'll you know go on the days i teach as well so i try to you know i try to make it like a rigorous discipline of going as much as possible um i it also just feels very like um centered in like this sort of uh, natural world universe all of that and i feel like sometimes that can be the antithesis to the city experience you know so i yeah. just like I wonder about your your headspace, you know, like going to your studio and like it feels like you've escaped to summer camp in the 1970s or something <laughs> when you do that. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the city. I grew up in New York City, actually. I've been here since I was five years old. Um, but I always felt a very deep connection to um to the country, to rural, you know, uh to nature. And um and we try as a family to leave the city at least during the summer, like to go July and August out of the city. So I, I have, you know, I do get out <laughs> of the city um, during that time, um, but uh, five months, spending five months, that was the first time that I've ever lived in the country for that long, so. Um, that was that was different than the past. Um, yeah, so it's possible to be a city kid and like nature. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> um, I have a question. You were talking about making that you wanted to make larger pieces, kind of like a Richard Serra thing. Yeah, uh, and I guess I make large scale, I do some large scale work as well on public art, um, but so far I've been working in steel because that seems to be what less, but at least for a while. But when, are you looking to make your stuff um, outside? So it'll be outside the public or where, if you do larger scale than what you've already done, because this is pretty large scale, where are you gonna show it and what kind of a home do you envision it to be in so people can see it? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I uh, definitely envision it more indoors than outdoors. Um, based on the materials that I used, it would be difficult to have them outside. Um, they wouldn't hold up very well. Um, not that I'm opposed to doing things outside. I would, you know, one day like to. Uh, do some outdoor works, um, you know, try, try to work with metal or, you know, something of that kind. Um, but for indoor spaces, you know, yeah, I don't, oh, I guess. About, how about corporate art or like airplane, not air, um, airports or like large venue places like that? Oh, yeah. Of course, well, yeah. any, any indoor space that that yeah, yeah. is large like that could accommodate um, a, a work that's made with fiber. 
So, uh, and what can, is the yellow uh, point things? Is that like cotton cloth or what kind of cloth is it? You uh, that's um, it's mostly uh, this piece here is mostly acrylic, oh. acrylic yarn, and there's also wool yarns in there. Well, what about the pointy, the pointy spikes? Oh, the like pointy things are muslin. Oh, okay. So that's cotton. Yeah, muslin. Um, and here the like the hanging pointy one that sorry the hanging yellow lines are also muslin. And then these other shiny thing shinier ones are that's the acrylic polymer. When you're making these those are like skin they're like skins you know like acrylic skins. When, when you're making these large scale pieces, do you think about like longevity or how would this hold up in a public space? Is the muslin going to deteriorate? Is it? Um, well, I think. You know, with fiber, it it hold it holds up pretty well, actually. You know, I, um, you know, like I, I don't really, I'm not worried about it. It's not something I want to even have to worry about. I think it's just I just want to use what I want to use and not worry about how long, <laughs> how long it's it's that can be someone else's problem. You know, like if they can send people to the moon, let them figure out how to make this piece uh, hold up more than, you know, a hundred years. So I'm just not, you know, I'm not concerned about it as. I feel like my that. husband here is always telling me I should be concerned about it. In fact, he's making faces over there. <laughs> I feel like that is like a beautiful. What's that? I feel like that is a beautiful line to 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 end on there. You know, they can send people in the moon. To the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Let them figure out how to make a breadcrumb last forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And I think we're. I don't want to take up too much of your time but this has been really lovely. And thanks to everyone for coming out and having all these wonderful questions. Um, yeah, it was really nice. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Harlan, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.